We must free ourselves from the hopes that the sea will ever rest. We must learn to sail in high winds. These quotes come from one of the most famous Greeks in history. His name was Aristotle. Aristotle, Socrates, Onassis, one of the richest shipping magnates of the last century. And like all who achieved greatness, Onassis was mostly remembered for what news reporters managed to catch on film or paper. Only that beneath his veneer of an opulent billionaire, Onassis appears to have been far more complex, even something of a philosopher, whose quotes reveal parts of the intelligence that made him rule the seas to become one of the richest men of his age. And unlike the tech billionaires of today, who make it a virtue out of having no fashion sense, Onassis belonged to a different age and relished in his glamour, conquering women in the high seas alike, bathing in riches while managing to remain curiously human. When his beloved son was killed in a tragic plane crash at the age of 24, Onassis' life was practically over and he deteriorated rapidly until he died knowing that all the money in the world could not save him from his fate. For those raised in the Christian Bible, Onassis will probably appear as guilty of the greatest of sins. Pride, the source of all the rest, as we are so frequently told, and his fate, a just punishment sent down from God. But for the Greeks of old who grew up on Homer and created one of the few lasting tributes to humanity, the tragic theater, Onassis' fate would be exactly what they would have expected and would even find it worthy of a hero. There's a curious little fact about ancient Greek heroes. They all end badly. Mighty Hercules, after completing his 12 impossible adventures that sealed him a place in Greek mythology, slays a jealous centaur who had just abducted his beloved Deinira, rescuing his wife-to-be from a monster. A noble task indeed, so noble, in fact, that with his dying breath, the centaur gives Deinira a headscarf as a wedding gift for Hercules. Alas, the scarf was filled with toxic poison that seeped into Hercules' head as the hero walked the aisle, burning his skin while he, using his incredible strength to pull it off, tears the flesh out of his head, dying in terrible agony. What is even stranger is that Greeks imagined even real historical figures to have met with a similar fate. Milo of Croton, a wrestler who was reputed to have lived during the 6th century BC in the south of Italy, was considered a real-life Hercules and the first man in recorded history to apply what bodybuilders today call progressive load by squatting every day with a young calf until the calf grew and Milo was finally able to squat with a live bull. On a spring day, walking alone in the forest, Milo thought of testing his new strength by lifting a tree up from its roots. But as he gripped the trunk with his mighty arms, his hands got trapped inside the tree's hollows. Tried as he might, he was unable to move until during nightfall, hungry wolves descended from the hills and ate the wrestler alive. And the list goes on and on, as if the Greeks could not just bury their dead, but had to see them disgraced before they died. The problem with those who try to read a moral into these stories is that often, like in the cases just retold, the hero's downfall seems to take place through no fault of his own. Onassis, however, had something that these strong men did not. Money, <laughs> lots of it. And surprisingly, this fact alone is enough for some to judge him as deserving of a downfall, even as tragic as the death of his only son. Because the truth is that most of us today are totally bipolar when it comes to the issue of money. We just love to hate it as much as we hate loving it. And without wishing to blame everything on religion, it's fair to say that Christianity has definitely not helped in relaxing our attitudes towards wealth. 
For the love of money is the root of all evil, the Bible reminds us. And so, it has sunk into the heads of many that the more money one has, the more evil they have to be by association. And evil deserves suffering, correct? Well, for those who take their worldview from the Christian Bible, the answer is probably yes. But the pagan Greeks of old who gave birth to the tragic theater would probably beg to differ. And to understand what they would have thought of Anassas' fate, we need to remove our Christian-tinted lenses and take a deep dive into the worldview that birthed the tragic theater, the tragic worldview. While the heroes of the Hebrew and Christian Bible walk the line between good and evil, Greek heroes fight between two other forces, Mira and Ivris. The first, Mira, can be translated as fate, but the word itself means portion or share, as in the share of life that each living being is assigned at birth. The Greeks literally imagined a piece of string weaved, measured and cut by three terrible women, the Mires or Fates, who were believed to be superior even to the gods themselves. According to this image, living was an act of eating up your share of the string, of always existing within limits set for you by the fates, never exceeding what's being given. Because exceeding those limits was for the Greeks the only thing that could ever come close to the concept of sin as Christians define it. This was the act of Ivris, the stepping over of one's share, like in the case of so many heroes who wished to become like the gods. And yet, isn't that what heroes are meant to do? Try and exceed what's been given? Even a short glance around us will show a world that is built by exactly those who did. Our technologies were designed to exceed what has been given to us by nature. Our political systems, our cherished democracy, was built by those who challenged the God-given rights of kings, by those who did not know their place in the old regime. And how would we know how far is far enough without those few whose very nature forced them to go beyond and pay the penalty. To understand Ivris as excessive pride, therefore, is to miss the point entirely. Because Ivris is not a moral transgression or a fallen state like Christians would like to believe, but the exceeding of limits that must be exceeded for human life to keep ascending. The entire story of the Iliad even as portrayed in Hollywood's Troy, moves by way of hubris, where hubris becomes the narrative engine that propels the story forward. Agamemnon, leader of the Greeks fighting against Troy, transgresses his limits by taking the woman of another, Achilles, who then refuses to fight and withdraws his army, weakening the Greeks' position. When their camp gets raided by the defending Trojans, Achilles agrees to at least send his beloved companion Patroclus, warning him, however, never to exceed his limits by attacking and to only defend their position. In the heat of battle, Patroclus disobeys and takes on Hector, the Trojan champion who only Achilles could have matched and is killed on sight. As a young child, Achilles was given a prophecy foretelling that if he were to seek revenge, he would soon be killed himself. Yet, blinded by rage over the death of his beloved, he takes up arms again and duels with Hector, killing him in front of his city walls while his wife and father look down. The Greeks rejoice as victory is now theirs, but just as they storm the castle of Troy and have exceeded his limits, Achilles will be shot dead ingloriously by a common archer. And if that is mere pride, then at least this tragic pride, because the Greeks have understood better than any other that there's something in human nature, no, in existence itself that needs transgressing, that needs for this that should not happen to actually happen, for the game of life to go on, 
And the price that the hero must pay for doing so is just the natural consequence of his greatness. Which is exactly why heroes like Hercules never had to do anything wrong, as his injustice was simply exceeding the averageness of life, and their punishment was merely for being so great. When Onassis said that every win is an injustice to someone, he must have known well enough that if this were to be true, then he, the greatest winner, had to be the most unjust. And during his life, shadowed by the FBI and news reporters alike, Onassis would be accused of everything, from illegal whaling to the assassination of Bobby Kennedy, until, just like King Xerxes in Aeschylus' tragedy, Onassis dared to meddle with the balance between East and West through Saudi oil, while just to add insult to injury, he married Jackie Kennedy, the Princess of America, a woman he then cheated with another, the famous diva Maria Callas. Two of the most celebrated women stolen by a man who, by today's standard of political correctness, would stand as a cross between Zorba the Greek and Donald Trump. Naturally, no man could be left unpunished after such transgressions. But for the Greeks who gave us the ancient theater, Onassis would never have been counted as a sinner. And yet, his tragic fate would not have been without a sense of justice, only that this justice would have nothing to do with the neat categories of good and evil that we have been drilled inside of our heads. No, for the Greeks we have come to admire, Onassis was punished for no other thing than his greatness. And as far-fetched as it might sound, there is something in his words as well as mannerism that shows that he somehow knew it. <laughs>